Hello everyone, this is Jim Lucy, Editor-in-Chief for Electrical Wholesaling and Electrical Marketing, with the April 19th edition of the Today's Electrical Economy podcast, sponsored by Champion Fiberglass. The company began producing epoxy fiberglass conduit fittings in 1988, and in 1989 developed the first conduit with epoxy resins that had flame resistance and low smoke characteristics. This met the most stringent codes and specifications. In today's broadcast, we'll explore some key weekly economic indicators that will give you a sense of where the electrical economy may be headed in the coming weeks, and take a look at which of the Biden administration's proposals in the infrastructure bill may spark the most demand for electrical construction materials. We'll also take a peek at the publicly held electrical stocks that have a large exposure to infrastructure work to see which ones have had the best start so far this year. Let's first check out those five key weekly indicators. Initial unemployment claims at the state level. Rail freight guard traffic. The Baker Hughes rate count. Oil prices and copper prices. Our thanks again to Champion Fiberglass for once again sponsoring the Today's Electrical Economy series of podcasts for 2021. We're delighted to be working with Champion. First up, unemployment claims at the state level. The weekly unemployment data from the U.S. Department of Labor and the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics highlights the states which with the most unemployment claims. It's valuable info for electrical distributors, manufacturers, and reps because it provides some insight into the unemployment state situation at the local level. The advanced number of actual initial claims under state programs unadjusted totaled 612,919 for the week ending April the 10th. That's a decrease of 152,833, or 20% from the previous week. The advanced unadjusted insured unemployment rate was 2.8% during the week ending April 3rd, and that's unchanged from the prior week. As a point of comparison, one year ago this time, the unemployment rate was 8.5%. The states with the biggest decrease in unemployment claims from the prior week using this unadjusted data were California, with a decline of 75,645, Virginia, with a decline of 23,119, Ohio declining 22,731, Texas with a decline of 18,083, Kentucky with a decline of 15,524, New York with a decline of 11,763, New Jersey declining 9,132, Massachusetts a decline of 6,216, Louisiana with a decline of 3,139, and Mississippi with 1,668. On the flip side, let's check in on the 10 states that had the biggest increase in unemployment claims from the prior, prior week. We had one or two states that had fairly significant claims, but then there were quite a few with, which actually were fairly uh, small increases in the number of claims. Minnesota led all states, 8,833. State of Washington, 4,832. Alabama, with 3,682 and Georgia with 3,368, Indiana, 2,519, and Wisconsin, 2,181. Several states were under 2,000 claims, but were still among the top 10 leaders were Colorado, North Dakota, Delaware, and Oklahoma. One of our other interesting leading indicators for the overall U.S. economy is freight rail traffic. It's a measure of the amount of raw materials and finished goods being shipped by rail. The best source for this data is the American Association of Railroads, or AAR, Publish this as data weekly, and you can access it at www.aar.org. For the week ending April the 14th, total U.S. weekly rail traffic was 513,724. That's up 24.5% compared with the same week last year. As you'll see in the next slide, for some rail traffic categories, the percent changes from the current week compared with the same week last year are inflated because of widespread shutdowns and the subsequent large reduction in rail ramps that impacted many economic sectors last year at this time. Grain led all other freight segments over the most recent week with a 24.3% year-to-date increase over last year's pace through early April. Total intermodal units were also up big at 14.3%. Other freight segments in the green for this week ending the April the 10th were metallic wars and metals, motor vehicles and parts, forest products and farm products, excluding grain and food. On the flip side, two categories showing double-digit declines over the pa- compared with last year were the petroleum, petroleum products at minus 13% and non-metallic minerals at 12.1%. Coal and chemicals were also in the red. If you track the oil market, you're probably familiar with the Baker Hughes rig count, which tracks the oil and gas rigs that are operating. This data is available by state, basin, and nationally at www.rigcount.bakerhughes.com.
We talk a lot about the different oil basins in the Baker Hughes root count, and this slide gives you an idea where many of those oil and gas deposits are. It gives you a sense of just how many of these oil, large oil players are in Texas and Oklahoma, and how big an area the Marcellus gas region covers in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and parts of West Virginia. The decline in the Baker Hughes oil rig count has lessened over the past week, but it's still down 17% year over year. The U.S. total rig count is down 90 operating rigs from this point last year, with the biggest decline being in the Permian Basin in Texas at 56 rigs. The Permian Basin is down 20% year over year. While it's certainly good to see the improvement in oil rig count over the past couple of weeks, it's also important to consider the longer term trends of where this market has been. Over the past 10 years, we have seen a four year period when the U.S. total rig count was well over 1,000 rigs. It had a high water mark in the past 10 years of over 1,600 rigs in October 2014. We've also seen some bottoms. In May, 6, May 2016, we hit 316 rigs. And uh, more recently, last August was the worst spot for the past 10 years when it had 170 rigs. With huge swings like these, you sure have to have a strong stomach to be in the oil market. Economists like to call copper pricing Dr. Copper because it's the leading economic indicator for economic activity. Copper is used in so many different industries with the construction industry among the leading markets because of its use in wire cable and copper plumbing pipe. Prices are still well over the $4 per pound mark, but they are a little bit off the recent highs. John Gross, electrical wholesaling's copper expert and the publisher of the Copper Journal, had a few interesting items in this week's report, which remains quite bullish on the copper market. He cited a Goldman Sachs report that said copper will hit $5 per pound over the next 12 months and that the metric ton price will hit $11,000. He says one of the reasons for this bullish scenario is the forecasted growth for the single family housing market, which is a major consumer of copper. Gross said that because the U.S. housing market is short 3.8 million single family homes, copper demand will remain high for the foreseeable future. He said in this most recent Copper Journal report, the average new single family home uses about 440 pounds of copper. Furthermore, building and construction activity overall account for about 46% of all copper consumed. Interestingly, transportation equipment re represents about 19% of consum total consumption, but given the expected growth in electric vehicles, this share of the market will grow even more significantly. I always remember, I was going back some years, the National Association of Home Builders had a slide that was published in the New York Times and some other newspapers, showed all the different the basic a number, the amount of building materials uh, in, in your typical house, which I think back then was about, I think that it was either 1,600 or 1,800 square feet. But I was always struck by the fact that they had copper building wire that was 750 feet of wire in the typical house back then. So I think this, this kind of segues into uh, that data, a little data point there from so long ago, kind of segues into this uh, copper market re important from John Gross and gives you an idea of just how important it is. Uh, if, if any of you would like to dig deeper into the copper market, I, I urge you to look, go to copperjournal.com. And John does a terrific job uh, of j in different trends uh, within the copper, the base metal, as well as some of the more precious metals. Let's spend a couple minutes on what the Biden administration's infrastructure proposal might mean to any the electrical market. While it's impossible to say what the Democrats and Republicans may agree or disagree on in terms of any infrastructure bill, the initial ideas in the proposal would have a huge impact on the demand for electrical construction materials. A big and hotly debated proposal in the bill is the plan for $174 billion in spending for the construction of a national electric vehicle charging network, rebates and incentives in the electrical vehicle manufacturing area, as well as rebates for vehicles purchased by consumers. In the bill, there's also a proposal for $100 billion for high-speed internet access for underserved rural and, ur rural and urban areas. That's a little bit uh, less contentious part of the bill right now. Uh, it, also in the bill is a, an $80 billion proposal for freight rail and passenger trains, as well as there's some massive spending on the electric utility grid, schools, daycare centers, VA hospitals, and commercial buildings. Let's dig a little deeper into that proposal for the electric vehicle spending, which in our industry would affect manufacturers of electric vehicle charging stations like ABB, Eaton, Leviton, Schneider, and Siemens. EV charging specialists such charge point certainly would also have an impact on electrical contractors who would be installing the stations, as well as the distributors that would supply it. In the proposal, the ex exact wording right now, so far at least, is that the plan will enable automakers to spur domestic supply chains from the raw materials to parts, retool factories to compete globally, and support American workers to make batteries and electric vehicles. It will give consumers point-of-sale rebates and tax incentives to buy American-made EVs, 
while ensuring that these vehicles are affordable for all families and manufactured by workers with good jobs. It, this bill would establish a grant and incentive programs for state and local governments and the private sector in the private sector build a national network of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations by 2030, but also promote strong labor training and installation standards. The Biden plan would also replace 50,000 diesel transit vehicles and electrify at least 20 percent of the yellow school bus fleet through a new Clean Buses for Kids program at the Environmental Protection Agency with the support of the Department of Energy. Also in the bill is $100 billion to re revitalize American digital, digital infrastructure, $100 billion to modernize public schools and early learning facilities, another $100 billion to re-energize America's electric power infrastructure, and $80 billion, as we mentioned a bit earlier, for the, uh, to invest in uh, passenger and freight service. The Biden plan would also have some uh, smaller but still significant amounts of spending, as we mentioned before, uh, $28 billion for the uh, VA hospitals, federal buildings, $25 billion on child care facilities, $25 billion to invest in airports, $17 billion to invest in ports and inland waterways, coastal ports, land ports, and uh, ferries, and $12 billion for community college infrastructure. I thought it might also be interesting to take a look at the infrastructure stocks in the electrical market that are beating the uh, Wall Street indices year to date uh, for, since the first day of trading, which was on January the 2nd. Might be surprised to see the top stock right now in the infrastructure market, broadly speaking, is the Quanta Services, that uh, large contract that it focuses quite a, quite a bit on the electric utility reconstruction. Also, we see Atcor up 80% year to date. Signify, large lighting company, it's up 56%. We've got a number of other uh, large electrical players that are beating the S&P average. S&P for a uh, year to date through uh, the second week of April, the S&P was up about 28%. Uh, some of the electrical players that are beating that handily that have a large exposure to the infrastructure. We've got Schneider Electric up 52%, Nucor up also 52%, Eaton up 52%. Uh, you can certainly consider Wesco to be a large uh, infrastructure player. They're up 47%. ABB up 43%. Uh, another player to watch too in this area right now is uh, MCOR Group, the uh, large contractor in the electrical and mechanical space. The MCOR is up about 39%. Hubble also about 30% just beating the S&P average. That wraps up things for today's podcast. Special thanks to the folks from Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring the Today's Electrical Economy podcast series for 2021. Please contact me if there's any other type of economic data that you would like us to cover in these podcasts. Our next presentation will be scheduled for Monday, May the 3rd. Thanks. Have a good day. And we certainly appreciate you listening again to the Champion Fiberglass series for today's electrical economy.